Welcome to the Believe, Be Real, Be Bold podcast for authentic dating in Denver. My name is Dave Glazer, your host and facilitator, where each week we bring expert guests to come share their knowledge, tools, and tips so that we can show up as our most authentic self. Hi guys, welcome back to the Believe, Be Real, Be Bold podcast. I'm ecstatic to introduce my guest today from Chicago, Illinois, Mr. Spencer Burnett. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, man. How are you? I'm fantastic. Yeah, I can't get any better than spring in Colorado. Oh, dude, and it's it's perfect out here too. I think it's our first 80 degree day here in Chicago, so it is. You know, the romance is in the air. I can smell it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can feel it out here in Denver too. There's something about spring in Denver, like going to Rockies games and getting outside to start playing kickball or um, co-ed softball or anything like that. It's just, people are vibing a little bit better now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when summer comes, that's when things really pop off. So I, I love the, I love the preseason to the, uh, you know, to the summer season. That's when everyone starts like reconnecting again, getting out of their holes from the winter and, you know, getting it moving. Yeah, I hear it. And like, I love all sports analogies, you know, I'm a big sports guy. And, um, and you said it's the preseason to the actual season coming up, you know, like spring right. goes around. Yep. So what is preseason like in Chicago? You know, people are, they're starting to get in a better mood because the beautiful thing about the seasons is the juxtaposition between the winter and the summer is like, you're so much more grateful for the good weather. So everyone's in a good mood. Everyone's starting to wear, you know, short sleeve shirts and some shorts, starting to see some sundresses and everyone's just getting ready for those magical hundred days here in Chicago where, you know, the sun is out. Uh, the weather's great and there's just a million things to do which opens up the opportunity to just meet meet new people awesome and and how is it exactly that you decided to uh, make a life and a career out of uh, relationship coaching you know it you know there's it, it's a it's a long story but in a nutshell i had so many friends of mine struggle in dating and uh, so many guy friends of mine and then i had so many female friends that would tell me like, ah, there's no good guys out there. And I'm looking to the left at all my friends who are struggling and I'm looking to the right of all these women that are saying there's no good guys. And I'm like, there needs to be a bridge because I'm, I'm seeing that there's opportunity everywhere. And so, uh, and so you know, seeing that uh, made me you know, decide like, hey, how can I, how can I connect these two uh, groups of people? Like I've done for you know, myself. And, um, and then I started doing that for my friends and friends became clients and clients became a business. Awesome. And who is it that you find coming to yourself, some men, some women, but specifically like, what are the commonalities? What are they saying to you when they, when they meet up with you? Yeah, I mainly, uh, I mainly work with men. And the thing that, that men come up uh, to me and say is, you know, they're sick of the dating game. They're sick of the, the online dating swipe culture. And they're looking for more depth in a relationship. And either they got burned before in the past, they've never, um, they've never actually been in a relationship, or they're scared to, uh, to um, really go deeper with, with a woman because they don't want that woman to assume that like, okay, well, well now we're getting married now that we've you know, been intimate, not just sexually, but like intimate, you know, and just sharing your life together. And so, uh, and so there, there's, you know, no, no one certain way to navigate that anymore. And so, uh, you know, in the past we could go to our fathers and ask them, you know, how they did it. But even if our fathers did it just the absolute perfect way, it's a whole new world out there. And so, uh, and so it's really, really confusing. A lot of mixed signals. Mm -hmm. How do you coach them to kind of change their mindset around those wrong assumptions uh, that you were talking about? Well, uh, the first thing is, you know, we, we tend to think that relationships are either like we're dating, you know, kind of seeing someone or we're in a relationship. And there's actually a, a part of a relationship that's in the middle of that. And I call that being lovers. It's somewhere between, you know, the first four to six weeks and the first, you know, three to four months where you, you know, you're not quite in a relationship yet, but you, but you feel like being committed to a single person. And, um, and that, that area in relationships is, is really, really tricky 
because you have to, you've got to learn how to, um, how to communicate, you know, what it is that you're looking for in a relationship, you know, what works for you, what, what doesn't, um, without jumping the gun too much and like just hopping into a relationship, but also not being afraid of commitment. And that's delicate balance. So you provide them with a new mindset and then what happens in their life? Well, they, uh, they, they start taking more risks because they're no longer afraid of the unknown. So, you know, being in a type of relationship that is, that is deep and committed, but it's not necessarily focused on, on the, the long term, that's a really scary middle ground. And once you understand that, you no longer fear it. And a lot of times we don't have that person that we want in our lives because we, we don't know what happens after we get the thing that we want. It's like, oh, I want to meet the perfect woman. Awesome. Now that you've met her, what happens next? Well, I don't know. Well, the fact that you don't know what happens next is actually the thing that's stopping you from, from you know, actually meeting that woman. And so, um, and so like the, the better you can feel confident in navigating a, a, um, a relationship that's living and breathing, uh, the, the more risks you're willing to take. That's awesome. What kind of um, suggestions do you give people to improve communication during that lover's gray area? Yeah, dude. Oh, that's a great question. So one of the things that I, that I teach, um, not just men, but, but you know, couples and relationships is you have to have regular checkpoint conversations, you know? So after the first three or four dates, it, it, you should start having conversations like, you know, what are you looking for in a, in a partner? What are you looking for in terms of like your relationship? Are you looking to get married in the next couple of years? Or are you looking to still kind of figure out what it is that you want? And no matter what that answer is, it, you've just got to make sure that you guys are on the same page of understanding the other person and that you're not sacrificing the thing that you really want in order just to be with them. You know, so that, that type of checkpoint conversation is really important because um, you don't want to waste anyone's time. You know, you've got to not only meet the right person, but you've got to meet the right person at the right time. And then the second one is somewhere between, you know, uh, six and 12 weeks in, you need to have a conversation where, you know, you're saying, okay, what is this? Well, what, what are we doing here? Because you can only casually date someone for so long. And I see a lot of men make this mistake. It's like, as long as she doesn't bring it up, we're in the good, you know, we're, we're in the clear. And I really encourage people to have preemptive conversations with their partner. And that means you're having a conversation before it needs to come up. And it's so much easier to have a conversation when, when, when you choose to step into that, you know, into that conversation as opposed to like the circumstance, you know, um, forcing you to have that conversation. So way less emotionally charged. So you're suggesting that about six to 12 weeks, you define the relationship based on what your intentions are when you started dating that person in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. And that doesn't mean that you have to, you've got to jump into a committed monogamous relationship headed towards marriage. It just means that you have to be on the same page and the other person has to be okay with it. So I've casually dated women for a year and we, and we check in, you know, we check in every couple of months, like, Hey, are, you know, are, are we still good here? Like, what, what is it that you, you know, are you getting what you want out of this relationship? And then, you know, I would share, you know, my position as well. And did you find that serving you long-term, short-term? That, I mean, that method or philosophy of communication and relationship serves you, whether you're just starting to, t you know, talk to someone all the way down to being married for 10, 20, 40 years. It's, you know, always, always, always checking in, not when something's wrong, but just when, you know, when it's time to, to clarify the, the agreements you have with each other. Yeah, being proactive, like um, maintaining your car with regular oil changes versus waiting until that 4,000, 6,000, 12,000 mile mark. Exactly, exactly. And, and what's so interesting is, is we do that with all other uh, areas in our lives. Like we do that with our, with our cars, but we don't think about doing it with the most important element of our lives other than our physical health um, or, you know, in, internal wealth, which is our relationships and our romantic relationships. Cause you know, I've, I've noticed that, you know, you can have 
I, I work with a lot of really successful um, men, you know, entrepreneurs, CEOs, you know, stuff like that. And I've noticed that if you could have everything you want in the world, but if your, your romantic relationship sucks, everything seems to not matter. You know what I mean? I mean, Jeff Bezos was willing to, to give up $40 billion because he wasn't happy. Like, it, it just goes to show the power that relationship has over, over the way we perceive life, you know, um, in general. So it's really important to, to nurture relationships. I 100% agree. And we're talking about the uh, CEO, owner of Amazon, and the guy's got everything in the world except for that love. So he was willing to give it up, give up that money. You know, I'd trade in $100 million every day for, uh, for one, uh, one beautiful relationship. Yeah. And that's where we find our alignment and our priorities have come back to um, to putting, putting it first, putting love first. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you mentioned uh, upcoming 100 days. Is that like a summer culture in Chicago? Yeah, there actually, there actually was a show at one point that I think it was only one season. It was called uh, The 100 Days of Summer. And it was, it was about Chicago because, you know, they say given, you know, it be 75 degrees out, there is no better place in the world, uh, you know, like Chicago. So we, we really embrace the, you know, the entire summer. And that really, um, you know, I've really found that for me and my clients, at least in this area, that it's the, it's, it's not only a good time to meet new women, but it's also a great time to start a, a new relationship as well. So everyone thinks that you want to be single, you know, in summer because, you know, everybody's out. But when there's so much to do, it's good to have just like one ride or die chick, you know, that you, that you just jive with and that, and that, you know, she's into you just as much as you're into her. And then you guys, you know, live the adventure of those hundred days uh, together. So I've got my, I've got my girlfriend um, in from uh, Miami and we're going to be spending the summer, you know, doing all of those, all of those things. So uh, I'm really excited about that. Awesome, man. Awesome. And we have a similar culture here in Denver, too, where people love to find an excuse to, to go to the Rockies game because they're standing on the rooftop and they're just soaking up the evening sun and enjoying life for everything that Denver has to offer. So I'm sure that our community here can completely relate to having a ride or, day, ride or die for the summer. Yeah. And, and Denver's got so many great outdoorsy things to do too. And, um, and, and Denver's like a pretty healthy uh, city as well. Like, you know, you guys are into like health and fitness and, and stuff like that, which there's a ton of really great communities of uh, people out there for that. So it's a good, good place to meet somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, how important do you find health and fitness as a pillar in relationship health as well? Oh, it's well, Oh man, that is one. You've got to make sure you guys are on the same page. If, you know, if she's vegan and you're not, or, you know, he's paleo and she's not, that can cause a rift in a relationship. And, you know, if that's one of your like top three qualifiers, like your non-negotiables of like, you know, a person has to have my same, you know, health lifestyle, then it could be a deal breaker. Um, and, uh, and, as a relationship goes on, you can typically tell when a couple is not doing so well or they're about to crash because you're going to notice that they're going to gain, you know, five to 15 pounds when you kind of get stuck in that rut where all you do is like watch TV, eat, and have sex, you know, and then as, and then that eventually gets a little bit old and then the sex starts dissipating, but the TV and the food just keep on coming. So I've, I noticed that in not only my relationships, but relationships with, uh, of, you know, my clients that um, you got to be careful of, you know, that relationship 15 pounds because it is an indicator that something's not going right. Sure. Uh, the couple gets comfortable and they become more of like a roommate situation than they do lovers. Absolutely. And, and the thing is, it's like being good roommates is important in a relationship. Like, like, you know, cleanliness and the way that you do the dishes and, you know, 
putting the cap back on the toothpaste, putting the toilet seat down, but also being good partners is really important as well. And what I mean by that is like including each other in your personal growth and your per personal maintenance. So me and my girlfriend, every morning, we do our morning routine together where we, uh, where we journal our projections of who we want to be during, you know, during that day. And then at the end of the day, we do reflections to see if we were in line with that person that we intended to be. Um, you know, in addition, you know, we go on walks, we go on, on, uh, on runs together, and we, you know, we go to events, we read books together. And so that's like being a really good partner is, is growing as individuals, but doing it together in an interdependent way and not a, um, not a dependent way. So, um, and, and so same goes for, for physical health. Like if you and your, and your partner are staying healthy together and paying attention to that part of your individual bodies, it's going to improve every area of your, your life. Your, your guys, deep connection, your guys, um, like, getting to observe another person improving themselves. It's going to improve the way you feel. It's going to improve your sex life. So is it necessary for a, a healthy relationship? No, but does it, does it help? I mean, it can't do anything but help. So I, I say it's uh, you know, a, a staple that you should have. I completely agree. Uh, exercise and nutrition can help boost confidence. Uh, it can decrease stress. Um, it can give you more energy. So you're able to live a, a better life with that partner once you find um, somebody with common interests, such as a fitness lifestyle here in Colorado. Yeah, absolutely. What do you tell your clients? You work primarily with men. What do you tell them when you kind of get the sense that they're avoiding the, uh, the conversation to define the relationship? <laughs> uh, well, I, I first kind of question well, what are you looking for? Because that, that is the, that's the first thing that, that, you need to, that you need to decide. So there's a lot, of, a lot of things that could be going wrong if they're avoiding that conversation. The first one is not having well-defined um, uh, vision of what you're looking for in a partner and in a relationship. So that's the first thing that we, we get to. And then next is, like, is straight up just asking the hard, honest question, like, why are you avoiding this? Like, and, and, you know, and a guy might say, it's like, well, I, I, I still want to date her, but I don't want to be like in a, in a committed relationship. And, you know, I always turn it back on them. And it, it's like, you know, would you want her to behave that same way towards you? If she wasn't all in, but this has been comfortable for her, um, but she's just not feeling it, would you want her to keep that from you? And the answer is always no. And so it's like, it's, you know, simple, you know, nice principles of being a human of like, you know, treat her the way that you want to be treated. And the further that you push a conversation back, the more charged it's going to be when you have it. So you can push it back, but just expect every day that you do that the conversation is going to get a little harder and a little harder until, until the point where where uh where you guys are just like waiting for the other person to screw up so bad so you can get out of the relationship and that never ends well right and i was perusing um your youtube channel uh, nice work by the way it looks great and one of your guests uh correct me if i'm wrong celine or selena was talking about uh -huh. um, um feminine energy being very intuitive and they could probably pick up on you're avoiding the conversation to define the relationship or avoiding any conversation when it gets down to it. Absolutely. Women have, women have a connection to their, to their gut and heart um, that, men don't, that men don't have. And of course, I'm generalizing, right? I mean, there, there are exceptions to everything. And it's a... Um, it's a, a yin and yang thing. It, like men are designed to be more pragmatic, more goal oriented, where women are designed to be a little more empathetic and um, and in, and intuitive. So, like in in knowing that, as a man, you need to connect more into that intuition, into that that heart energy, that that gut energy, so you can meet her at that at that place. And if as a man, if you're connected to your intuition you're going to be able to feel her feeling you avoid it. And that's, and that's going to, that's going to motivate you to have that call or not that call, but that conversation, because it, it's, 
when you when you're both aware that you're that someone's avoiding something some like you tend to both be nicer about it for instance have you ever been wanting to change lanes while you're driving a car and someone won't let you in but then you go make eye contact with them and then they're like yeah okay go in like it's it's that same thing when you're seen in a tough situation and like truly seen people tend to be more kind it's when we turn our heads and avoid making that eye contact that we're willing to screw somebody over and tuning into that intuition and that gut instinct is is that where your philosophy of the omega man comes from absolutely you know the in, in this day and age there are no set gender roles like it, they used to be you know in the 50s it was man goes to work and uh you know puts the roof over the house brings home the bacon the woman takes care uh k- takes care of the children keeps up the house and today it's so different on every level first of all most families can't get by on one income anymore <laughs> it's just the way that it goes um second of all women are women want want uh a variety of things these days and look if it's a woman if it's a woman's uh you know vision for her life to raise a family and uh and you know keep a beautiful home awesome but there are other women that want to build careers and build businesses and uh chase their artistic visions and and stuff like that and so uh you know we've we've i hear a lot of complaints that like well women don't need us as much as they used to and that's not true like we we all need each other we're we're designed to be social beings women just need men differently and so it's not just the it's not just the you know uh the visionary uh goal achieving you know hard masculine energy protector that she needs she needs that but she also needs the other side of you what are known as the beta traits and beta doesn't mean weak it it just it just means sensitive it means that you can take a supporting role it means that you can that you can play an empathetic role it means that that you play more of an emotional role in the upbringing of your children and so that's not that's not weak and this is where a lot of men get confused is is they're like well alpha good beta bad no it's having having all of the attributes and then the discernment of when to express those attributes cuz she still needs you to be a man she still needs you to be a leader she still needs you to take charge but there are also times where she needs you to take a back seat she needs you to take a listening ear she needs you to take a support role and and that's why good communication and good communication practices are so crucial in this day and age because what once you are in touch with those parts of yourself it's then in the listening and in, in the communication of when you discern when to express each of those attributes and when was it that you um maybe personally discovered this or um were taught or exposed to this kind of um omega man philosophy oh man that's another great question dude i <laughs> i do a lot of podcasts and i i have not really gotten it that poignant before and um and it's a great question because i love the answer and it is my my parents i i watched my parents play such a well balanced role in my life my you know my dad uh, you know my dad was the the kind of guy that like the kids never talked back to but he also was the kind of guy that never had to raise his voice you know um my my dad is a uh, very like you know he he loves people he forgives people he's lighthearted but he also is like responsible and a really clear communicator my mom's a little uh more fiery my mom like has you know masculine traits of like going out and getting what she wants and um and my mom also worked but she also was uh, an amazing like compassionate you know mother and she and she was a good like supporter of my dad and um i just watched them i just watched them play that situational leadership in such a harmonious way where in certain areas of of my parents relationship my mom is the one who's in charge and in other areas my dad's the one that's in charge and i always i kind of joke with them like who would need who more if the other one were to pass away and it's like they're they're so complementary in the way that they have built the relationship that they truly play um different but equal parts Mm-hmm. totally understand that that must that must be hard to measure up to you know uh again my my parents are uh my my parents are so supportive of me making my own mistakes while still giving me guidance 
And so in, you know, I'm 36 years old and I, uh, you know, I've been, you know, actively dating since I, I was, you know, 13 or 14 years old and they've seen me make a lot of mistakes. I've been in every type of relationship you can imagine. Uh, I was married before. I was with the same woman for nine years from high school. I, uh, you know, I had a, a live-in girlfriend long-term, non-live-in girlfriend long-term. I've been in four or five triad relationships and, um, and I've been in open relationships. So I've really gotten an opportunity to explore like different types of agreements in relationships. And, uh, and, you know, even though it wasn't exactly the way that they built it, my parents have been together since my mom was 12. Um, uh, through the experience of watching them and all of the experiences that I've had, and then also my 10 years of, you know, dating and relationship coaching, um, I, you know, I feel like, uh, I feel like they're, they're really proud of, you know, the man that I become and how I, you know, how I treat my woman. So the standard is, is high. Um, but you know, I, I, I strive to be, uh, like, you know, like my parents, so I don't mind the measure. Got it. Um, I'm in a similar situation. My parents are, are really, really good um, examples of what it takes to make 46 years worth of marriage work. Mm -hmm. um, it must take a lot of awareness to combine all of those attributes between alpha and beta to become uh, the person that your partner needs at, the, at any given moment. Yeah. Yeah, it does. What tools and tips would you have for somebody to gain that kind of awareness um, so that they can show up like that? You know, the first, the, you know, as corny as it sounds is it, it starts with you. And what I mean by that is you have to be the type of man that you like hanging out with and then find a woman who, sh who shares those, that interest, the interest that you have in you find a woman that shares that interest. Whereas most men try to become who they think she wants. They find a woman that they find attractive and then it's like, okay, who do I need to be in order to be with that woman? It, that's, that's backwards. So, um, you know, a, a lot of, a, a lot of not only personal development work, but personal experience. So getting out there and, and dating a lot. And what I mean by that is not, you know, sleeping with, you know, a, you know, a dozen women a month. I'm saying get out and legit, like meet people, get to know them, see what makes them tick. Go on a few dates, figure out what it is that you like, figure it is, figure out what your non-negotiables are, figure it is what, uh, you know, where your boundaries are when it comes to, you know, whatever standards that you have. But only when you have standards and, and, and um, I don't want to say expectations, but like, but just well-defined desires of, of who you, uh, who you uh, are, then you can have, and in who you want, that's what's lays the foundation of being able to have a, you know, a relationship that is, that's well balanced like that. So let's say that we've uh, established our standards and our well-defined desires, and we determine that those are not the same as expectations. Where do mm -hmm. we find somebody who's going to be at, first of all, attracted to those kind of traits that you've created within yourself from all that work, that self-development, the personal growth, where do we find them? And how do we ultimately make it our ideal relationship? Another great question, man. So where do you, where do you find it? Well, there's literally, uh, you know, there's literally a, uh, you know, a, a billion women on the other end of this phone that I'm holding right now. You know what I mean? Like I've, you, we've got access to so many people. You can go on, you can go on Tinder and, and you know, swipe for, for literally two hours without passing, without passing a second person twice. So the opportunity to meet people is not the problem. It's how we're going about doing that. And the best way to do that is to, is to um, go to gatherings, events, you know, uh, parties, shows, music, where you have a, a strong, you know, interest in. So if you're someone who just absolutely loves concerts, go meet people at concerts. If you're someone that loves fitness, then meet someone at, you know, at the gym or at a 5K or, or something like that. So going into places where, where shared values is what brings everyone together, that's where you're going to uh, find, have the best chance at meeting a quality person. Furthermore, there's a difference between um, going to events or parties and, jo and joining a community. 
a community is like going to events of like-minded people, but you do it on a regular basis. You know, a, a, anything from a Facebook group to a, you know, to, uh, to church or other, you know, other um, uh, groups that meet on, on a weekly basis. So that's my, that's, if you are looking for the right person, that's the way that I suggest that you do it. And I have found that it's possible to find someone on Tinder, but it's like trying to, you know, fish by throwing a grenade in, in the pond. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it, you're just, you know, kind of seeing people as just like commodities. And I think that, um, I think that changes the perspective of the connection when you start off. And then to your next question is like, how do you make it work once you find someone that, that you like, and maybe you guys have different expectations. And one of the exercises that I, I give, uh, I give couples that are, that are rather new. So let's say, you know, somewhere between that, you know, two and six month mark, depending on how fast it moves, is I, is I suggest that you sit down and uh, by yourself as individuals and you make a list. And, the, and this list has two columns. And the first column is what I'm willing to give you. So it, this is like, this is how I'm willing to show up. I'm willing to take out the garbage. I'm willing to set aside one day a week for us to spend un, you know, uninterrupted uh, time together. I'm, I'm, I'm committed to, and that's actually the, the list, it's what am I committed to? I'm committed to never raising my voice to you. I'm committed to being honest and faithful. So whatever these, these are, and as you know, as you get more deep into your relationship, you know, it becomes more intertwined. You know, if you're living with a woman, it's like, you know, I, you know, I commit to wash my dishes before I put them in the dishwasher, you know? Um, and then, and then, so what am I committed to? And then the second column is what do I desire? So like, what, what do I expect out of a partner? Well, I expect a partner to be faithful. I expect a partner to be punctual. That's one of mine. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's really hard dating beautiful women when punctuality is uh, one of your qualifiers. Because <laughs> they take care of themselves before they go out. It, absolutely. And it's, and, you know, as they should. But I will say this. My, my girlfriend missed a flight one time. And I was, I was like, you know, punctuality is a big thing. And I will say this. It's been a year and a half. And she is, she is so punctual to everything. So super proud or super happy that, you know, that she, you know. But anyways, so the, so the next thing is like, what do I expect from you? And then when you when you create those uh, the the that list of two columns, then you sit down as a couple, and then I read what uh, what I'm committed to, and then she reads what does she expect out of me. And then if it's at some point that what I'm what uh, what she expects out of me is not on how I'm committed list, then then needs a conversation, like, okay, well we. Well, we both don't like cleaning the toilet, so how are we going to manage this? You know, I'm just giving you like a simple household one, but um, it it can go for it can go for anything. And so, when you compare the, those the two lists that you guys have together, that opens up a conversation of like what your agreements are in your relationship, because expectations are are um, standards that you have of another that you impose onto another person. Whereas agreements are standards that you two both, you know, you, you two both agree on. And that's healthy for a relationship. Yeah, more of a partnership than a relationship. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're a huge advocate of pe meeting people organically or in the wild, as a lot of people are calling it nowadays, uh, versus online. Am I Absolutely. Captain? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, online, the the online is really starting to get watered down. I, uh, more and more people are just, are, are not happy with it. And they, um, and they just wish that they could, you know, have real connected human interactions, which you can do online. It's just a lot harder when someone's not in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be in that boat as well. Um, I'm a busy business owner, which would, uh, let's just say it would lessen my opportunities to join a community or go to a live event. Mm -hmm. But if it's a priority for me, then I'll make the time for it. Just like I would if I come across that partner. Absolutely. Um, when you say agreements in a relationship after sitting down for this exercise, it really sounds contractual and that not necessarily in line with the, uh, 
mm, quote unquote unconditional love. Is that correct? Ah, uh, unconditional love. Well, first of all, the contractual part, it starts off that way. But then as you get dig into it, it's like, well, if she has an expectation of me that I'm not willing to give, what is it about that expectation? What need of that is that fulfilling of you? Is there another way that I can fulfill that need? So it, it sparks deeper, more empathetic conversation, although it does start a little pragmatic. And to the, to the uh, notion of unconditional love, love itself is unconditional. Uh, divine love is unconditional. Human love is conditional. It is conditional. Because so I mean so and people might say no no it's not like me and my husband are, are unconditional love like okay what if what if he intentionally throws a brick through your car window because he's mad at you you still in what if what if he hits you still in what if he cheats on you still I mean we can get we can go gnarly with this you know what I mean like what if he hurts one of your kids you still in like what what if he go what if he what if he does all of the above and then goes on a drug bender and spends all your savings are you still in you can love someone even though they do something really shitty to you, but you can love them from an appropriate distance to where they, know, they can no longer hurt you. And so, the, so you can still love someone while taking a step further back. Every woman I've ever dated, I still love. I never speak ill of my exes because they're a part of me. They're a part of my story. And, uh, and I, I still love them. But at what distance do I love them? Some of them, you know, I still, you know, I'm still on good terms with, or where they, you know, they can call me for some advice or just tell me what's up. Others, you know, I, I don't contact anymore, but I love them all the same. It's just how close am I willing to have them? And when you're in a relationship and you're trying to, you know, find your, your soulmate or your twin flame or, you know, uh, or, you know, your person, it, it, love becomes, uh, there becomes more and more trust with that conditional love and that is that feeling of, of unconditional love you know it, when i don't have to ask you questions to see what you're up to you know i i trust you when you tell me um when you tell me anything very well said um i definitely wanted to go a little bit deeper into that um that that's a hot topic you know of contractual versus unconditional and our society really puts an idealistic impression and vision and expectation when it comes to love. Mm. Yeah, well, there's always two sides to it. There is the agreements, which is, you know, as you say, contractual. But then there's, there is like the forgiveness of, you know what, I said, you know, I, I said that I, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna work late anymore. And I've worked late all the, these four days, like, uh, I'm sorry. Well, I don't suggest that people are like, well, you said in your agreement that you were willing to show up like this. And I said, I had that expectation and you agreed to it. And now it's like, screw you. Well, no, it's like, there's compassion. Like that's where heart comes in. And, and, and that's where conversation comes in. And where like, uh, again, like empathy and understanding and forgiveness of you to her or her to you. And so when, when there's breakdown, then that's where the, the compassion and that, and, kind of a more a higher level of unconditional love comes in but there's certainly a balance between the two because if you're too contractual well that's not love that's an agreement but if it's all unconditional love you open yourself up to abuse so in in this world that we live in it, it is seemingly one of duality you know you're either sitting or standing you're moving north or going south but the the truth is we need to be able to hold the the idea of um of you know, the idea, the idea of like two things being true, we're always looking for, is this right or is it wrong? And it, it truly is living in balance and then the discernment of where to be on that spectrum of like, hey, you must, you know, you agreed to this, I'm going to hold you to it. And hey, you agreed to this, but I forgive you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't use those agreements uh, as weapons later on down the road, because then that defeats the purpose. Absolutely. Yeah, it takes all the compassion, all the empathy, and all the grace out of the equation when we're throwing it back in the face of the other. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when things break down, 
especially as men, we tend to go straight back to the agreement. Well, you said this, you said this. And when a relationship's in breakdown, I, you know, I have a, a, a method called feelings first, facts second. And so you address how the situation is making each other feel first and sort that out first. And then we can talk about, you know, what, what we a- agreed to. But it's like, what matters more, the contract or our hearts? And that is defined by the way that you manage the situation and the way you prioritize it in, in the way that you manage it. So when you, when you address her feelings first, well, then that's demonstrating that that's more important. They're both important, but that's more important than the, than the, the agreements. I got it. Got it. So if your message resonates with somebody out there, what's the best way to get a hold of you? The best way to get get a hold of me is you can go to spencerburnett.com. And uh, and if you want to check out like how to build a relationship, like as a man, I just wrote a book called The Cool Guy's Guide, The Game of Romance that, um, that we unveiled actually last Wednesday. And this is a guide on uh, not necessarily teaching you how to get the girl, but once you are, once you found a woman that you really like, how not to screw it up. And it goes through the five phases of the first year of a relationship on how to build a, a relationship with a woman in a way that is um, that is um, that is equal but different in terms of you know power dynamic, and one that is stable and exciting, one where you're not handing over your masculinity but you still are you know you still have you know empathy and and support and you know like I said you know listening ear. It just teaches you how to build a relationship in a in a really uh, you know, exciting and healthy way. And in that book, we, we've got, you know, uh, I, you know, I talk about those five phases of building that relationship. And then we give a bunch of, uh, a bunch of ideas on how to do that specifically for your woman. And then we tell fun stories in there of how, you know, me and uh, my co-author, Matt McCahill, uh, have actually implemented some of these things and how they've turned out for us or maybe didn't turn out. Awesome, man. I really appreciate it. I know you're a busy guy, so I won't take up much more of your time. But if there's one thing you want to send us off with today that maybe we briefly touched on or didn't get to, uh, what would that be? Oh, man, it's out there. Like, it, I know that the relationship might not feel like it's close. And sometimes we find relationships in the most unexpected places. And I, I do know this. We have so much access to each other. And the world, in my opinion, is um, like there, there's, there's hope for deep love and connection um, because of like technology and the way of our society is going. And so it's, it's out there. So don't, don't quit because I, uh, I found my girlfriend because I hashtag spirituality in a face in, in an Instagram post. And she, ty- she typed in hashtag spirituality in, uh, in her, uh, in the search bar on Instagram. We had no mutual friends. She was from Miami. I'm from Chicago, and we connected uh, over, you know, the, our you know our internal connections with God, and it turned into something. So I, it's like I could tell a thousand stories about how people met a thousand different ways, um, and uh, so it it's out there. Just keep putting yourself out there, and um, make sure that you love you, so you can demonstrate how you should be treated by that person once you finally find them. Got it. Very well said, man. Congratulations and good luck with that lady from Miami. You're going to have a great summer, I bet. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's uh, yeah, we, we had a, we had a good summer last year, but we spent a lot of it in Miami. So this, this one we're spending in, uh, in Chicago. So I, uh, I cannot wait. The season is almost upon us. Well, good, man. Thanks again very much for your time. What do you say in the next six to 12 months, we jump on Facebook or an Instagram live and and we shout out and we give some advice. um, So where people can interact and ask us questions as we go. I am absolutely down with that, man. I, uh, yeah, this is, I like, I love everything about you, your community. And so I think that would be a great conversation to have. Well, thank you very much. Uh, We'll put it on the books. Awesome. Sounds great. Thanks, Spencer. All right.